Let's go. Let's open up in prayer real quick, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so let's pray. Uh, Father, right now, we thank you for this day. And Father, we know this is the day you made, and we'll be glad and rejoice in it. And Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather together in your name. And Father, your word declares that if two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst of them. So right now, Father, we just acknowledge the presence of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for all that you purpose to do with us gathering together. Father, I pray, Lord, that you touch the heart and the mind of every person out of the sound of my voice. And Father, as I communicate your heart, as I communicate, Father, the word that you've given me, the burden you've given me, Father, I pray, Lord, that you grace me to minister to your people. Your word declares, if any man speak, let him speak as an oracle of God. And you said, oh God, if any man minister, let him minister the ability that you supply. So Father, I humble myself. And I acknowledge my frailty, I acknowledge my weakness, I acknowledge, oh God, every human element, but I pray that you anoint me to minister to your people, and I pray, Father, that the hearts of those who hear will be good ground. Father, you said one man plant and one man water, but you bring the increase. And I ask, Lord, that you will bring the increase in the lives of all those under the sound of my voice. Even now, I pray that you soften their hearts to your voice. And I pray, Father, that whatever you desire to communicate, whatever you need them to hear, I pray, oh God, that you give them ears to hear what the Spirit of God is communicating. Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to minister to your people. And I I consider it a responsibility, and it's not a light thing. So, Father, I just thank you for your anointing and your spirit and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. So that makes everything better. It's something about prayer that really um, shifts you and makes everything so much better. So I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Darnell Craig. Um, I didn't get to say my age last night. I'm 32 years old. I turned 33 in March. Um, So I'm the, you know, the young blood here and I'm excited to be here with so many great people. It was awesome to hear the Taylor speak. That was my first time ever hearing them speak. So it's dope to see the tag team tandem and to see how iron really sharp as iron, you know, and it's amazing how you can be connected with people and I know them because they, they say some stuff that I'm going to say. So it's like, you know, you go after people. It is what it is, but I'm grateful to be a part of this. I want to honor the Humphreys as well. You know, it's so, I think we grossly underestimate, like I said, the sacrifice time and service it, it takes to make an event like this. And we just see the beauty of it. Um, but we don't always see the blood, the sweat, and the tears. So I just want to encourage them. According to the word of God, it says that God is not unjust to forget your labor of love and the way you minister to his saints. So I just want to encourage them and make them aware that your labor is not in vain and that God will reward you for your service, you know, the sacrifice that you made to be a blessing to people. Because it takes selfless um, selfless people to facilitate an event to bless people when seemingly you gain nothing from it, but in the natural, but spiritually, the fruit will be great. So we're excited to be a part of this. And with no further ado, I want to go ahead and get into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the name of this event, of course, is Before You Say I Do. So I want to contribute uh, my part. And um, it's going to be kind of systematic. I'm doing something unusual because I'm more of a flower. I kind of flow, and I, I know I'm going to get into my flow, but I want it to be very thorough because. Um, I'm speaking from a place, you know, I'm speaking from, I have a unique perspective, number one, being a single, but also being divorced, you know, having gone through a marriage before and knowing what that feels like. And um, my divorce created a chain of events for me, um, and I didn't want anyone else to go through what I went through. You know, um, I can say that I'm a living witness that God can restore you from a divorce. You know, people are shocked that, you know, back to myself, that I'm good, Um, and I didn't know what a divorce to do to a person. I didn't know how people lose themselves. I didn't know the pain, the trauma, the disappointment that comes from that. So I'm a living witness of God restoring to you what the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillars devour. You know, I'm here in my right mind. God has delivered me. I'm whole. But it wasn't easy, you know. And even going through that divorce, one of the first things that God spoke to me about was the Lord told me to finish a book I was writing. I started writing a book in 2017 called Exploring the World of Dreams. And um, I wrote a book on dream and dream interpretation, but every time I would write it, the devil would discourage me and tell me nobody wants to read it. So I'm like, I said, hey, there's no point. So I started in 2017, wrote a little bit, stopped. I started in 2018 again, wrote a little bit, stopped, and I stopped for like four years. 
And then once I um, went through the divorce, God spoke to me. He said, I need you to finish the book uh, because there are things that God spoke to me about in dreams that could have saved me from the relationship that I didn't understand. So I finished writing that book and I talked about, you know, how God can warn you and how God will speak to you and things like that. You know, so I'm speaking from a place. I'm speaking from a place of experience. I'm speaking from a place of wisdom. And also I'm speaking from the heart of God that he shared with me. I don't claim to know the entire heart of God, but I know the part that God has given me. And I want to share that with you um, today. So in this session, it's going to be like we're on a journey. We're going to go through a lot of scripture, so, you know, let you know up front, but it's going to be worth your time because what I intend to do is I intend to equip you where you'll know what you need to know before you say I do. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to the book of Genesis chapter 2, the book of Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to start with before you say I do, Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to go to verse, um, <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, we're going to go to verse 18. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. One of the things you have to understand before you say I do is that marriage was God's idea. It's not a human construct. It's not a human concoction. It's God's original intent. But the purpose of God making marriage was so that um, to... The Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. You know, I think that before we say I do, we have to deal with the um, strongholds, the vain imaginations, and the high things we have about marriage. You know, um, I saw something a couple of months ago, or some, maybe sometime last year, and they talked about um, organically, you know, they talk about culturally modified Christianity. And I believe that's what we kind of embrace, that we allow the culture to dictate our beliefs. And a lot of us, um, speaking to, about the body of Christ, we don't really have a scriptural or biblical worldview. We interpret things through the lens of our culture. We interpret things through the lens of our upbringing. But if we're going to be effective and be uh, walk the way God ordained us to walk, we're going to have to get back to the beginning and begin to understand God's original intent. So we talk about God's view, not anyone else's view, but God's view. When God spoke about marriage, he said it's not good for man to be alone. And what this speaks to is that it was never the God, it was never the will of God that you would be alone. That word alone is very interesting in the Hebrew. When I looked it up, it has to do with being severed. It has to do with a branch that's cut away from a tree. You know, and Jesus says something interesting in John chapter 15. He said that without me, you can do nothing. He said, if you abide in me and I in you, you can ask what you will and it will be done for you. But he talks about a branch that is cut away from the tree. And he says that when it's cut away, it begins to wither. And that's what happens to a lot of us because um, we don't have relationships. We don't have meaningful connection with other people. We begin to wither. We begin to draw up and we don't begin to be the people that God ordained us to be. You know, God has ordained us to be communal beings, community, communal beings. We're not supposed to be islands to ourselves. We're not supposed to be separate from everyone else. We need relationships to thrive. You know, I like a, a saying I heard before. They say it takes two of us to know one of us. That's why it's not good for you to be alone, because when you're by yourself, when you're isolated, when you're not in community, when you have no family, you have no relationships, you have no connection, you don't really know yourself. And that's why people that are isolated and people that are by themselves all the time, when they get into relationships, it is, a, 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 it is an awakening for them because they didn't know themselves. They never walked with other people. They, you know, they never um, saw their blind spots. They never were made aware of things about themselves that they should know. They never knew how to cooperate. They never knew how to collaborate. They never knew how to partner, but it was never God's will that we should be alone. It was always God's will that we should have meaningful relationships because we were made for um, community. We were made to do life together. You know, there's an African proverb. It says, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. It says, but if you want to go far, go with others. And a lot of us, we just want to go fast. We want to do it our own way, but we need each other. We need each other because we're members of a body. When you receive Jesus, the Bible says that you're baptized into the body. That's the first baptism you go through, the baptism in the body of Christ. You're no longer 
member, an individual, you, you are individual in a sense, but you're a member of a body. You don't function as an individual, you function as a member, and you're a member that contributes. You're a, men a member that adds value. You're a member that um, shifts other people. You're a member that helps other people. No matter what you think about yourself, no matter what your level of visibility is, no matter what your level of notoriety is, you are essential to the body of Christ. Every joint supplies, every member contributes. And when we begin to realize that we need each other, this is when we're um, able to function in a healthy relationship. This is why a lot of relationships aren't healthy because we're so isolated and we, um, we're isolated and we neglect our needs. Now, there are four basic needs of a person. Number one is the need to contribute. Each one of us has a need to contribute. We have a, a need to um, contribute. And this has to do with your calling. This has to do with your purpose, your destiny. You know, when you, when you see an individual that, um, that, that has not fulfilled that need to contribute, a lot of times that leads to control, that leads to competition, that leads to jealousy, because we're our own unique individual. You are, you know, the Lord um, gave me a saying years ago. He said, you have to be perfectly fine being one of a kind. And you really have to be okay just being yourself. There's nobody like you. Nobody's ever been like you. Nobody will ever be like you. And that's okay. And that's great because your difference is what makes you valuable. Your difference is what makes you essential. But God has given you something to contribute, to contribute to the body of Christ, to contribute to your family, to contribute to society, to contribute to the world. And we all have a need to contribute. Number two, we have a need to choose. You know, so it's one of the things that I kind of dislike about the current um, structure of the church, you know, um, globally or just corporately, is that they take away your choice. You know, um, one thing about a parent, you know, and I'm not, a, I observe these, you know, I don't have kids yet, but I observe parental relationships and I counsel and whatever. But um, one thing I would say from my observation, I would say the joy of a parent is to raise a wise child, to know that you pour wisdom into this child and this child can make their own choices. You don't have to lord over that child, you don't have to dictate to that child, but you infuse that child with wisdom where they can make wise choices. And that's God's will for you, that you make wise choices. The Bible says that I set before you life and death. You know, he said, choose life that you may live. It's God's will that you, you choose and you choose wisely. So we all have a need to choose. We don't need to be controlled. We don't need to be lorded over. We don't need to um, be um, dominated, but we need to choose and we need to choose wisely. Number three, we have a need for competence. Every one of us need to be good at something. We need to be capable of doing something. If you see a person who who um, has lost their need to be competent, who lost their need to, um, to, to, to be capable. That person is, is missing something major in their growth, their development, in their psyche. But God has made us to need to, to, for, to be capable to, to, for competence. And to do that, he's given us gifts. He's given us skills. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities that we're supposed to steward and supposed to develop to the highest potential. But this is what causes us to be competent. This is what causes us to be able to um, be capable of doing something no one else can do. And the last need we have is that need for connection. We were made to connect with other people. And sometimes that's demonized. You know, um, sometimes in the body of Christ, it seems like we believe more in aestheticism than Christianity. And aestheticism is when you basically isolate yourself, you become a monk, and you, do not, you deprive yourself of your needs. And, you know, a lot of times we think that the going without needs is spirituality. But the Bible says that God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So every need you have physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically, and physically, God wants to provide. It's not God's will that you live without your needs. And when we try to live without our needs, this is why um, things begin to go to ruin. This is why things get so bad for us, because we're trying to live a life that God never intended us to live. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 18. We're still talking about before you say I do. This is kind of like a, a intro. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm being, I'm, I'm going, I'm functioning a lot more. I'm just being thorough. I'm being systematic. I have a lot of content to cover, and uh, we're gonna do this. And I'm gonna hit that time as well. 
Okay, so Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1, it says, One who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. So one thing about American culture is American culture is individualistic. The thing about the kingdom, if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to sacrifice. Ah, the first thing Jesus says, if you desire to come after me, you got to first deny yourself. When you receive Christ, it's no longer about you. It's about him. And the cross you bear is the death to ego. You know, Jesus didn't come to crucify your personality, but Jesus did come to crucify your ego. In other words, you're not living for yourself anymore. You're living for him. You're living for God's glory. You're living for God's kingdom. This is countercultural because everything we see in American culture is about you, self-preservation, self-satisfaction, and self-promotion, and um, selfish ambition. But if you want to walk with God, you have to die to those things. And this is why it's good to be single, because when you're single, you can die the deaths you need to die. You know, Paul said, I die daily. And sometimes there are things we have to die to that better prepare us for being in a relationship. But we have to lose this individualistic attitude, because as long as it's about me, you're not going to be able to thrive in a relationship. You know, um, and I'm going to I'm going to divulge this information. I want to delve into the things that happened with me and how things fell, but I want to pull from different concepts as I'm teaching as well. But when you get married, saints, um, marriage is not about maintenance. Marriage is about um, the merging of two lives. Marriage is about two becoming one. Um, the power struggle in my situation was about the maintenance of the old. When you get married, you have to be willing to let go of your old life. You have to be willing to, you have to realize that marriage is a death, but also it's a birth. If you read the scriptures, he says, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife. It means that one family is not ended. One family, the importance of this family um, lessens in comparison to the new family that's being created. And this new family is being created, a new infrastructure is being created, and there has to be a recognition of that. You know, a lot of times people get married and they try to maintain the old order, they try to maintain the old lifestyle, they try to maintain the old hierarchy, they try to maintain the old priority system, and it fails because that's not how it's supposed to work. But what happens with us when we talk about, um, when we talk about marriage or we talk about, you know, this transition, we're not, um, a lot of times through either marriage counseling or the kind of teaching that we hear, we're not adequately equipped to be married. You know, you have people that get married for the lust issue. What the Bible says, you know, it's better to marry than to burn. And that's, you know, that's scripture. But it will be better for you to have self-control and get some knowledge. So when you get married, you'll know what you're getting into and you'll know what this is going to be like because marriage is not the fantasy that you think. You know, there are, there are, um, <laughs> there are highs and there are lows, you know, and there's a, you know, you're going to look in the mirror a lot when you're married. You're going to see some stuff you did not think. And you're going to think that you dealt with stuff that you have not dealt with, but it just hasn't been touched. You know how you have a sore spot and, you know, you think everything is good, but you walk a certain way and you, oh, you know, I uh, still sore. You know, just because you have not touched it does not mean it's been dealt with and God will use a person as the chisel as the instrument um, as that that sandpaper to help you get to where you need to go so it's it's not wisdom to live an isolated life the Bible says that God takes the solitary and he puts them in families it's God's will that we coexist as the family of God. It's God's will that we learn how to relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And the greater we can relate in a community, the greater we can relate in family, the greater we can relate in friendships, that prepares you for marriage. You know, if you look at the quality of your friendships, the quality of your, your family relationships, and the quality of you know, your church relationships or um, Christian relationships, that's a preview of what marriage will be like. Because if you're not thriving in those elements, it's, it's not going to, you're not going to thrive in the other elements as well. It's going to be, it's actually going to be more intense because now you add romance, romance in, and romance has a tendency to make people illogical. So, um, you know, if you can't handle sober relationships, it's going to be a, a wake up call for you when you get married. So, before we say I do, we have to understand God's original intent. And we have to let go of our vain imaginations, our strongholds, and our hot things about 
marriage. So marriage has become a, a wealthy industry. You can become famous talking about marriage. You see viral podcasts. You see all these people talking about relationships. But if we're going to thrive in marriage, we have to let go of these vain imagination, strongholds, and high things. And, you know, this is spiritual warfare. You know, you hear a lot of people talk about spiritual warfare. But Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He said they're mighty through God. And one of the greatest weapons of warfare is the word of God to, um, to demolish or the word of God to um, deal with your strongholds, your vain imaginations, and your high things. Most of your warfare will be in your mind. And the Bible tells us to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That word renew in the Greek is renovate. So it's like you were to move into a room, a house, and you realize this needs to change, this needs to change, this needs to change. We're going to renovate this, renovate this, renovate this, and then it's more occupiable. That's what God does with you and your mindsets. You know, we've been miseducated, we've been misinformed, and God wants to show you things from his worldview. And a lot of the things that will hinder you in marriage is your ideals, your fantasies, your vain imaginations, your idolatry about marriage that will cause you to engage in a power struggle because you're struggling with what you fantasize, you're struggling with what you believe, you're struggling with what you thought this was gonna be like, and it's not healthy, it's not realistic, and it's not godly or proper. So you have to understand these. So I'm gonna say some strong things, and you know, I'll stand on these things. So I want you to hear my heart, but I'm willing to take whatever. Okay, so marriage is not about ministry. Marriage is not about your individual purpose. Marriage is not about you becoming a power couple. And marriage is not about endless sex. I feel like these are the things that the church and the world put upon us. So you'll have a good husband that's not a minister, not a pastor, but because he can't teach, preach, or prophesy, you won't marry him. That's error. Or you have someone who, um, you know, you're great, you're a mogul, you've established this, and this person does not have what you have, but because they don't, and we're not talking about broke, but because they don't have the status, the acclaim, or the, the, the clout that you have, you won't marry them. Nothing to do with marriage. Or we talk about purpose. I'm going to marry this person so, you know, um, so we can fulfill our purpose and et cetera. When you look at it, you go back to God's original intent. God didn't say something about purpose. God didn't say anything about power couple. God didn't say anything about ministry. He said, it's not good for this man to wither away and die. He said, it's not good for this man to be an island unto himself. He said, it's not good that this man has no one to relate to. He said, but let me make a helper or a companion for him. So you talk about marriage from God's idea. Marriage is about two people coming together and covenant with God and committing to love, friendship, companionship, and they, they, they commit to presenting before God a godly offspring. When you look up, um, one, when God talks about marriage, another thing he says is he says that he desires a godly seed. So marriage first is for, for those two to have companionship, to grow in friendship, and to grow in love. Because marriage, I I love how, um, and most people do not say that stuff. I love how um, Mikhail talked about marriage being about a a reflection between Christ and the Father. You know, most people just talk about Christ and the church. But marriage typifies union with God. Marriage is 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 a typification of God himself because God is one, right? And we talk about God being one. We talk about God is complete. God is you know, the only self-existent necessary, I mean, the only self-existent being, which means he needs nothing outside of himself to exist. But God is a typification of unity, oneness, and community. And in God, you know, three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they're one. When you get married, you're typifying the union of the Godhead. You're typifying what this is about. And it's so interesting because when you talk about you know, marriage, the, the things that we, we, we um, strive for, the things that we, um, that the things that we um, value or prioritize, we forget about union, we forget about oneness, we forget about community, we forget that our relationship in this marriage construct is designed to reveal to those around us how the Godhead functions, reveal to those around us how the Godhead relates, reveal to those around us how the Godhead can be um, individual, but move as one. 
right? You don't get married to lose yourself. When I say lose yourself, to lose your identity. You're gonna, there's gonna be a merger, there's gonna be a union, two will become one, but it's learning how to function as one, right? It's like Jesus said, I and my father are one. In other words, he said, when you see me, you see the father. We're so one, we represent each other. We're so one, we function the same. I'm doing what he would do if he's here. I'm, I'm revealing who he is. Am I right about it? So interesting. So when we talk about marriage, um, before we say I do, we have to get back to God's original intent, and then we can better prepare ourselves mentally, emotionally, and spiritually for marriage. So if we don't get back to God's original intent, this is why things begin to fail. If we don't get back to God's original intent, this is why things break down. So no further ado, we're about to go on this roller coaster. Are you guys ready? Because we're, we're about to hit a lot of stuff. Okay, so I got some things written down before you say I do. So number one, before you say I do, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 13. <laughs> Oh my God, this is so like, going this way is so intriguing. For those, I mean, if you ever heard me minister, I don't do this, like I don't, I don't, I don't operate like this. I just kind of, I'm All right, 2 Corinthians 13, verse five. It says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Number one, before you say I do, you need to examine yourself. You need to know your, um, you need to know your standing in God. You also need to know um, your convictions, you need to know your beliefs. You need to know how to build a strong relationship with God. Before you say I do, you need to examine yourself. But when I talk about examination, I'm not just talking about examining yourself in your faith. This is very important. I think that we have bought into an ideology that just because you're Christian, your marriage will work. Uh, we've been bought into your ideology just because you pray together, your marriage will work. Prayer and being a Christian does not guarantee a successful marriage. What guarantees, what helps in successful marriage is learning basic principles of relationships. That's why it's so important that we have healthy relationships. That's why it's so important that we have the relationship with our mother, our father, our friends, our, our um, church community, or the family of God, because there are things you're gonna learn in those relationships that's gonna help you show up um, healthy in the relationship with your potential significant other or your husband or wife. Because when you don't learn the lessons you're supposed to learn from your family, your friends, and the church community, you're not going to be able to, to um, healthily or skillfully apply the wisdom you're supposed to learn from those relationships. So I, I would not advise you to get married and marriage be the first relationship you learn how to relate. Marriage be the first relationship you learn how to connect. And marriage be the first relationship that you learn how to walk together. You need some type of healthy relationship outside of a marriage because there are principles you want to learn outside of a marriage that's going to help you greater show up in marriage. Also, we talk about self-examination. We're also talking about the knowledge of self, you knowing yourself. Because a lot of times people get into relationships and don't know themselves at all. When you're single, this is the time to learn yourself. You need to learn why did God make you. You need to learn your purpose, your destiny, your calling. And we talk about this stuff. A lot of times this stuff is um, overinflated or over-exaggerated. What I mean by that, when I say knowing who you are or knowing your purpose, your calling, you know, the way that God made you, once again, you are unique. You have to be perfectly fine being one of a kind. I didn't, you didn't join this union or this marriage to become that person. You didn't join this union or that marriage to become what they want you to be. You join this union and this marriage to be yourself, to show up as the most healthy you, to show up as the most whole you, to show up as the most uh, prosperous you. And when I say prosperous, we're talking about the condition of your soul. We're talking about thriving in your perceptions, thriving in your imagination, thriving um, in your desires, thriving in your personality, thriving in your will, your emotions, and, um, those kind of things. Because when you don't know yourself before you get into a relationship, you want to lose yourself. And what's going to happen is you're going to become what this person wants you to be, or you're going to become what you think this person wants you to be, and you're going to be miserable. 
because that's not the way that God made you. You have to realize that when you embrace yourself, there is a sharpness that God has given you. The Bible says iron, sharp as iron. There is something in me that when I engage in relationships, when I engage in mentorship, when I engage in, in, um, in, in the relationship with my mom, with my sisters, when I engage in a relationship with my brother, the way I am sharpens those around me. And I will be selling myself short to be anybody else but me. Now, that does not mean that I cannot work on myself. That does not mean I cannot improve. That does not mean I cannot mature. But there's a uniqueness to the way God made me that everyone around me needs. And you need to know what God has given you that people around you need. We're not talking about becoming everyone's um, prophetic voice. We're not talking about becoming everyone's um, teacher. We're not talking about becoming everyone's whatever, because I don't show up in all relationships as an educator. What I do, I educate. That's what I've been doing since 17. But there are relationships, I'm not showing up as an a, 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 a educator. I'm showing up as a confidant. I'm showing up as a as a, 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 a support. I'm showing up as a friend. I'm showing up as a as a um, encourager. I'm showing up, you know, as a as a um, a mentor or whatever. But what I'm saying is that you have to know the way that God made you. You have to be confident in the way that God made you because for you to exist, it means you're necessary, right? God is a God of purpose. There's nothing that God created that's unnecessary. So God created you. You were born for such a time as this. If you don't feel that way, God will awaken you to that fact. And God will reveal to you why he made you. God will reveal to you what he wants to do with your life. God will reveal to you where he wants to take you. God will reveal to you the kind of people that you need around you. And this is what God does because God is a God of revelation. And the spirit of God was given to us to show us the thoughts, the plans, the purposes of God for our lives. And the spirit of God was given to us so we can know the things that God has given us. But one of the reasons that marriages do not work is because we don't know ourselves. We've never examined ourselves. We're not strong and solid in our faith. Or we never have learned the way that God makes us. And then what's going to happen is you're going to be a person that tries to be a people pleaser or try to do things for our service because what you're trying to do is you're trying to gain a love that can only come from God and you're trying to gain an approval or affirmation that can only come from God you know the affirmation of people is secondary is supplementary but the primary affirmation and approval should come from the presence of God you have to learn in your own relationship with God how to receive God's love and if you learn how to receive God's love, it's going to free you from rejection. I'll never forget, I remember I was dating this, this, um, this girl years ago. And I remember um, when I connected with her family, I, we were going to meet her family. And she was just like, her family was like well off. And I remember pulling up to the, uh, pulling up to the house, it's like a six, seven bedroom house. You see all the Mercedes and thing. I'm like, I'm like, man, I, and my mom think I have nothing. I'm like, you know, how I want to impress these people. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm pulling up. I gotta be like 22, 23, and I'm all this stuff, and I'm just like, wow. And I remember I go into the room, and um, when I would go places, you know, I'll duck away and I'll just pray. And I'm I ducked away and I went into prayer. And I'm just, I'm like, Lord, I said, you gotta help me, man. I was like, I have no idea, like, who, how I'm supposed to, like, impress these people or how I'm supposed to show these people that I'm worthy or whatever. And in the middle of me praying, the Lord spoke to me and He said these words. He said, I accept you. And then, you know, I'm in shock. And he says it again. He said, I accept you. And then the Lord spoke to me out of Ephesians chapter one, I believe verse five. It says that he accepts us and the beloved. And when he said that, it freed me from my issues with rejection. Because prior to that, I was always trying to get accepted. And I, I even began to realize that in my relationship with God, everything I did was so that God would love me. And I remember like, Coming from where I come from, when I met God, I met God, I didn't, no one brought me to God in terms of preaching, teaching, or et cetera. I grew up in church, none of it appealed to me. Um, I had encounters with God, I forgot about him. I, the first time I heard God, I was like seven, eight years old. And I um, had this vision, I prophesied, all this weird stuff, completely forgot all that. None of this stuff appealed to me, but when God met me, I was without hope. I was like, I was in DHR. I was about to be on the streets. And when God met me, 
he gave me value. And at that point in my life, it's like, that's the, this is the only person that believed in me. And I'm like, because this is the only person that believes in me, I'm gonna give him my all. But I didn't know that I was trying to perform for God's love. And that's one thing, you know, for those who are ministers, or forget about ministers, just being a child of God, man, you gotta make sure that you're not trying to earn God's love when God's love is a gift. You know, there's so many things that we do because we want God to accept us. We want God to be pleased with us. We want God to, you know, love us. But he loves us without reason. He loves us without cause. He loves us because that's who he is. But in that situation, it freed me from that struggle of trying to be something to people instead of just to be myself. And a lot of times we're not gonna thrive in marriage until we just embrace ourselves and embrace the love of God and we call the living for that audience of one. There's one person that I wanna please. There's one person that I wanna do this for. And as long as he's pleased, as long as he gets the glory, that's all that matter. So I'm gonna show up as myself. I'm not gonna show up competing. I'm not gonna show up performing. I'm gonna rest in who he says I am and just walk that thing out. If you wanna be successful in marriage, you need to know that. Um, number two, we're gonna to go to 2 Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six, very popular verse. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14. It says, do not be mismatched or unevenly yoked, unequally yoked, traditionally, with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and lawlessness share together? Or what light, what does light have in common with darkness? Or what harmony does Christ have with Belial or Satan? Or what does a believer share with an unbeliever? Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from the midst of them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, in Hebraic culture, when you talk about a yoke, when, in their culture, um, when they talk about a yoke to them, that symbolized um, doctrine or yeah, doctrine or belief systems. So in this scriptural context, when it's talking about don't be unequally held together with unbelievers, in this context, it's talking about mixing your belief systems. Why that's relevant for us is because one of the prerequisites for Christian marriage, you wanna make sure you marry someone of the same faith. You wanna make sure you marry someone of the same belief system. Um, because what happens is when you try to, you, well, you can't mix faiths, you can't mix belief systems, because most of the time it's gonna to lead to a compromise between you, uh, with you. Because the thing about walking with someone, the dangerous thing, well, I ain't gonna say dangerous. The thing you need to know about walking with a person is that anyone you walk with has the power to influence you. You know, so Abraham, looking for a wife for Isaac, he told his servant, he said, do not take a daughter from the Canaanites, from my, my son. Because he knew that the woman that his son walked with could affect his faith. So you as a Christian, before you say I do, you need to make sure that you're yoking or you're with someone that believes in the Lord. You wanna make sure you're with someone that lives by their faith. You know, the Bible says there are people that profess to know him with their lips, but their heart is far from him. And it's, it's not your place to know the hearts of people, but you can know the fruit of people. And you can know a good tree by good fruit. And you know a bad tree by bad fruit. So. Before you seriously consider someone as a candidate, you need to know the fruit of that person. And fruit takes time, you know? Um, the Bible says as long as the earth remains, it's gonna be seed, it's gonna be time, it's gonna be harvest. And the fruit you see from a person is a, is a harvest of their thoughts, their words, and their character. It's gonna take time. You're not gonna know a person overnight. You're not gonna know a person in a day, you know? Um, a lot of times we fall in love based on our idea of a person but time will correct that idea. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person all the time, but uh, sometimes they will be. But there are gonna be times where, I know right, there are gonna be times where you, uh, <laughs> you have to let time correct what you perceive or what you think. That's super, super important. I think one of the things that in my, um, one of the things in my, in my marriage, I began to realize like, we just don't believe the same things. Like, we have different convictions. Um, I think that's what one and two matters because there are times where um, you or people 
they will become what you they think you want, or they'll become what um, they'll become what they think you want them to be, or they will pretend to be something that they're not, and that can only be sustained for a short amount of time. And what happens in those contexts is, is that the person that is masquerading becomes miserable. And a time, you know, when, when the scene is up, when the act is over, your part is over. Like, you can't play that part forever. And you only play a part for so long. And you have to make sure that before you get into a relationship, that you're authentically you. Like, who are you without external pressure? Who are you without external suggestions. Who are you like, what do you like? What do you prefer? Where do you like to go? You know, that, that when we talk about that, I wanna go back to that real quick. When we talk about that examination, one of the things we used to do in the church I grew up in, we used to do this thing called a personal profile. And I, this is just practical wisdom. What we would do is three times a year, every quarter, we would just write down our five strengths, five things about ourselves that we like or our strengths. And then after that, <laughs> We write down five weaknesses, five weaknesses about yourself. And when you do the five weaknesses, after you do five weaknesses, you're also gonna write five ways you can change that. And they'll give me three months to work on myself or to grow. But what would be very interesting is we had another part. <laughs> and this is how we can tell if you're healthy or if you're whole. You had to let your friend say your five strengths and your five weaknesses. And sometimes the things that your friends will say will be very interesting because you didn't see that about yourself. So imagine one of my friends be like, hey, you never wake up early, you always late. He's like, whoa, I just, I just, I just called, called down. So I, I thought I worked on that for a year. He's like, you, you slipping, my guy. So it's, hey, look, that personal profile gets you right, but it helps you examine yourself. And if you could be self-aware, and if you could know yourself, then once you meet other people, you're not trying to be something you're not or you're, you're able to take constructive criticism, you know? That's gonna help you out a lot. But we talk about, you know, before you say I do, you need to make sure you're equally yoked. You guys believe the same things. You know, one of the things that happened in my marriage, or before we got married, we were dating. We were dating probably like a month or two. Everything is going great. Like, I meet this person, you know, um, we're like on the same wave. You know, I'm, I'm like a learner, I love God. There'll be times where we'll be FaceTiming behind her. All these books, you know, she haven't gone through courses, done all this magnificent stuff. And on paper and like face value, everything seems perfect. I mean, like we're not arguing. Like I'm, I was used to arguing with people or it's clashing because of what I believe, you know, when you're a teacher, you correct error. And sometimes people don't like being told that's not true and the pride of people manifest. And then I was powerful. I knew a lot at a young age. I've been learning since I was 17. I've been mentored since I was 17. So I'm learning from people like three times my age, you know? And I'm, I'm, I know some things, but I was powerful about it. So um, in this situation, everything's going great. No arguments, everything's perfect. I went to sleep one night and I had a dream. And I had a dream. <laughs> I had a dream that we were at this conference and we compare it to here. And we're walking in that door and we walk by that last table and there is, there is one seat at this, that last table in the back and right where, um, right where let's say this, this table right here is like two seats. So we walk by this, this chair and in the dream, my girlfriend at the time, she sat down in that seat, that, had, that table that had one seat by herself. And I remember in the dream, I was like, hey, I was like, it's two seats right there. I was like, let's sit right there. And in the dream, she would not move. She would not move from that seat. And I'm thinking like, oh, that's so weird. And the person that's escorting us, trying to show us that it's two seats. And in the dream, she wouldn't move. And I just went and I sat by myself. So I remember when I had the dream, everything was perfect. I mean, nothing going on, no arguments, same way, fasting together, all this stuff. And um, what happened was I woke up from that dream and we talked. And I told her, I said, I, said, I, mean, I had a crazy dream last night. She's like, what happened? And I told her the dream. First of all, there are certain things you shouldn't share with other people. You should keep that between you and God. Because me sharing the dream prolonged things that should have never proceeded. Because what happened was when I told her the dream I had, she temporarily made changes. 
So God was showing me in the dream that we weren't compatible, but God was showing me, in the, basically God was showing me in the dream that she would not leave her position. And I was trying to persuade her to do some things or go a place, she didn't want to go. Now, I didn't know that at that time, she had reservations and hesitancy about certain things I was trying to implement because I was seen as a person that was just so into God. And my passion for God was higher than hers at that time, or zeal for God was higher. And there were things that were like basic to me that was seen as too much for her, but I didn't know. But God was telling me in a dream what was going on. But that's when we talk about being equally yoked because God does speak. You know, one of the things that we'll, we'll get into that, but yeah, God would say God does speak, but you have to make sure you're equally yoked. We're going to go to another thing. We're going to go to, um, let's go to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. How am I doing on time, Lou? I'm good. All right, thank you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to go fast, man. I got Right, that's perfect. Jesus, this is blessing y'all so far. All right, let's do it. All right, Proverbs chapter twenty-five, verse twenty-eight. It says, "Like a city that is broken into and without walls, so is a person who has no self-control or rule over his spirit." One of the things that, if you want to succeed in a marriage, before you say "I do," you have to develop emotional intelligence. You have to be emotionally intelligent. What is emotional intelligence? Emotional intellig intelligence is the ability to perceive, interpret, demonstrate, control, evaluate, and use emotions to communicate with and relate to others effectively. Once again, emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive, to, in to interpret, to demonstrate, control, evaluate, and use emotions to communicate with and relate to others effectively. So one thing that is crept into the church is stoicism. And stoicism basically says that you deny all your emotions and you feel nothing. And the, the less you feel, the closer you are to God. That's stoicism, which is error, because God has made us with souls, right? And your soul includes your emotions. You know, and emotions communicate to you. And emotions were given to you so that you can experience life. A person that is stoic is denying themselves life experience. Like you're, you're not enjoying life. You're not participating in life. Your life isn't uh, strong. Your life is, uh, I won't say invalid, but your life, is, um, your life is false if you're stoic. You're meant to experience emotions. You have to experience joy. You have to experience sorrow. You have to experience ecstasy. You have to experience, um, um, I don't say negative words. You have to, you have to experience um, excitement. You want to experience laughter. You have to experience pain. You know, some, some for, I say so much, every person, there's pain laid aside for you. You know, the Bible says it pleased God to bruise Jesus. <laughs> Some pain is for your destiny and your purpose. Because when you're going through certain things, it's not about what's happening to you, it's about what God is making you into. The Bible says the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to compare. So in other words, the things that you're going through cannot compare with the, thing, the person that God is making you into. But there is pain. The Bible says that though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. So you will suffer things. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You will go through things. And when you go through things, it's okay to feel them. You know, one of the things that helped me um, get through my divorce was, there's a verse in the Bible, Jeremiah. He said, heal, not, maybe Isaiah. I believe it's Isaiah, Jeremiah. He said, heal me, Lord. And I think it's Jeremiah. He said, heal me, Lord, and I'll be healed. And he said, save me, Lord and I'll be saved. And there'll be times where I'll be like tears just rolling down my face and I'll be praying that prayer. I just heal me, Lord, and I'll be healed. And if you save me, Lord, I know I'll be saved. And I'll be praying that prayer because what happens with us when we, when we don't have emotional intelligence, we deny how we feel. We deny it. You know, here's the thing. Just because you feel something does not mean it's another person's fault. 
You have to be able to accept responsibility for how you feel and not project how you feel upon other people. You know, because even if, if we were to get into an argument or a conflict, I'm responsible for what I did and you're responsible for what you do. And you can't excuse your own, you can't deny your own responsibility or allow your emotions to overrule you so much that you no longer can accept responsibility for your own actions and your own words. So if we're gonna be emotionally, if we're gonna be healthy partners, because we're talking to singles, people that are single that wanna be married, what I'm giving you basically, I'm giving you a blueprint to work on yourself. I'm trying to make you being single. I want you to just count, have the countdown day I get married. Like somewhere in between the day of your singleness and the day of your matrimony, you need to grow, change, develop, mature, evolve, you know, prosper, enlarge. These are the things we're giving you a blueprint on things you can work on and do. And these are things I wish I had known prior to marriage or wish I known growing up. Because the church has a, a tendency to oversimplify things or overgeneralize things. And it, it, the church has a tendency to just say a lot of stuff that doesn't hold a lot of weight. So I'm trying to help you practically. I love how Nicole was giving practical things, like practical things that you can take home. You'll go somewhere, hear somebody preach, and it was dope. But you can't think of one thing they said you can apply. <laughs> right? Oh, it was great, man. They talked about how to hear God's word. And that's great, but what can you do about it? Right? So we're going to talk about emotional intelligence. I want to hit you with something real quick as it relates to emotional intelligence. Um, how can you tell that you are emotionally intelligent? What are ways you can tell that you are emotionally intelligent? Let me do something real quick, you guys. How can you tell that you're emotionally intelligent? Number one, the sign of a person that is emotionally intelligent is number one, you think before reacting. <laughs> How many of us react without thinking, right? The Bible says something interesting. It says, and please don't be offended, this is overall. <laughs> it says that he that is hasty in his spirit to be angry is a fool. In other words, if you have, don't have emotional self-control, you wanna do some foolish things. How many of us have done things we just regret all the time? Why did I say that? Why did I respond that way? Because we don't have emotional intelligence. But the Bible says it this way. It says, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's emotional intelligence. That I'm not, I'm, before I react, you know, one of the, the best things you could do before you react is just breathe. <laughs> Literally, breathe. Because breathing just regulates your nervous system, and it calms you down. And then also, before you react, Inquire. Let's not assume that what you perceive is true. Like one thing that I realized in a dating escape, as I, you know, I'm dating again, people do not give you the benefit of the doubt. Like they really have a narrative that they're going to run with, and it's you against that narrative. But it gets so interesting because I've been in situations where when I share my heart, you feel crazy. Because what you thought was not what it was. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what you thought is not what it was. It's better to say, hey, you know, uh, did you mean this? Or um, did you mean this? Or what did you mean by, like, uh, give this person the opportunity to, and this was marriages too, but because in marriage, it'd be the same way. Something happened, and it'd be like, you did da 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 It'd be like, hey, Lou, what did you mean by this? And let Lou tell on himself. Well, I meant, you know, da 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 da. And hey, he can't get out of what he just said. You see what I'm saying? But that's, that's, that's overcoming some of the narratives we have in our own mind. Because sometimes we're operating from rejection, we're operating from bitterness, we're operating from um, anger. And there are false narratives that when we talk about emotional intelligence, you're feeling these sensations, you're feeling these feelings because. That, like, for example, um, I'll use an example. For example, you could have grown up and had a mother that always told you what you weren't. And then you're in a marriage or in a relationship, any relationship, and someone tells you something, and your mind goes back to your mom, and in that situation, you're talking to your mom. You're not talking to me. Because you're still responding to the person 
you're still responding to the person you have not forgiven. The moment you're trapped in emotionally and you're, you're having all these sensory perceptions because your emotions are still tied to that moment. But if you're gonna be healthy in a relationship, you gotta be able to think before reacting. You gotta have some kind of system in place to calm yourself down. And I, like once again, you have to feel the feels. Like sometimes, I, I told people before, man, you have, you have to be in your feelings to almost feel like you're drowning sometimes because you have to feel what you're feeling because your feelings are telling you something. But your feelings are telling you more about you than about the other person. So you, we, we, when we evade responsibility, I want to project how I'm feeling on you. I want to make you the source of how I feel when my feelings are trying to teach me something. So this comes over me and I, I feel this, but this feeling is trying to show me something I've not addressed, I've not changed, I need to work on. But if I evade the responsibility of my own emotions, you're the cause, right? And that's not a healthy person. A person that always will blame you for everything. Now, we're not saying that people are sinless, faultless, or people don't do things. But if we're going to grow as people, we have to take accountability for our own emotions and do emotional inventory as well. Why did you respond that way when this person said this? And sit and think about it sometimes. What, what, what was I thinking when they were saying this? Where did my mind go? Because these are things that will help you become a more well-rounded person. Another way you can develop emotional intelligence is to, the signs you're growing, is you're self-aware. How many of us are aware of ourselves? You're aware of where you stand. Like, for example, I'm aware, I'm not the most patient person. Like, I'm very aware of that. And it'll be times where, and I, it'll come out in so many different ways. We could be, we could be playing 2K, and my, they'll be like, I'm gonna be here in five minutes. You say five minutes, I'm gonna call, call, call. What's up, man, hurry up, man, da, da, da. But I'm aware, that's something you gotta work on. And it'll be ways I let that process play out and I put myself in situations where I have to learn to be patient. But I'm aware that that's a problem area for me. What are your areas that you can acknowledge that you need to work on? Because if you don't know those, it's gonna be hard for you in a relationship because you're gonna be in denial. Your pride's gonna manifest. If somebody tell me you're not that patient, I'm not gonna get mad because I already know that but it's something I'm actively working on and I'm not ashamed to say I'm working on it. And I lose nothing from saying that. But that's our pride, like, when, when, when you're prideful, you can't be wrong. When you're prideful, you can't have a problem. When you're prideful, you're living out the image you want other people to think you are. Like, that's why knowing yourself and showing up authentically is so important because we live, like, the one thing that people do in the church, they're very good at hiding problems. They're very good at hypocrisy. And we talk about hypocrisy, is not always what we think it is. Um, a hypocrite is a person, according to Greek culture, a hypocrite was an actor. So a hypocrite put on a mask, they played their role, and then once they get off stage, you take the mask off, and that's who they are. That's what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is a person that can't be themselves. You have a mask on, I never can know the real you. That's a hypocrite. And a lot of us are hypocrites in our relationships. They're not people that know the real us. We, 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 we're, we're afraid to tell people our fears, our struggles, our issues. We have to put on the mask, be perfect, and then once they get away, it's so many times I prophesy to people and I've seen them in, like, in relationship contexts or just by themselves, crying these silent tears, and I would just say a simple word, and i said, say, hey, God sees you, and he sees those tears you're crying. And they would just break down because they could not, they didn't feel like they could be themselves around those they loved. But that's not a them problem, that's a us problem. Because there's nothing anyone should be able to do that should make you not be yourself. And if they can, it speaks to a, a deeper issue. Right? Another way that you can tell you're emotionally intelligent is you can empathize. Empathy, empathy, empathy. What is empathy? Empathy is the ability to put yourself in other people's shoes. How many of us can, let's say for example, let's say I'll use a Lou. I love using Lou for some reason. I'll use a Lou. So let's say I went back to Lou and I said, hey, I'm freezing. I, I ain't gonna lie, I'm, I'm freezing now. Like it's, a, it's an act of God, I'm standing up. But 
<laughs> hey, I, I went back to Lou and I, I said, Lou, I said, I'm freezing. And Lou empathized. He put himself on my shoes and tried, he made something happen. That's empathy. He didn't think about himself, he thought about me. Remember, if you're gonna follow Jesus, you gotta think about other people. You can't always think about you. You gotta put yourself in other people's shoes. If you're in relationships, how often does someone tell you something and you put yourself in their shoes? A lot of us, once again, emotionally, not, not emotionally intelligent, we just wanna react to what they're saying. We don't wanna put ourselves in their shoes and consider how they feel. You're like, wow, I didn't even think of it like that. I apologize, I was wrong. I didn't even think you did all this. And that was my reaction, I apologize. That's empathy. But that takes emotional intelligence. So if you're gonna be good and, cause what I'm doing, I'm just seeding you with stuff, but I'm giving you homework too. Cause some of this stuff you're gonna have to look into. Um, all right, let's go to Luke chapter 17. I'm, 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 I gotta move a little faster, man, let's do this. All right, Luke chapter 17. How much more time I got, Luke? Oh, okay, I'm good. All right. Luke chapter 17. Thank you, Jesus. <sighs> Luke chapter 17, and we're gonna go to verse one. Now he said to his disciples, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks come or offenses come. He said, but woe to one through whom they come. He says, it's better for him with a millstone hung around his neck and he's thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to sin. Verse three, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Number four, you need to learn conflict resolution skills. If you're gonna be healthy in a relationship, before you say I do, you need to know how to resolve conflict. And he needs to know how to resolve conflict in a healthy way. You gotta realize that when something arises, that person is not your enemy. <laughs> And if you're responding like that person is your enemy, it's the enemy. <laughs> because remember, the enemy is the inner me. So something is going on inside of me that needs to be addressed. See, if, if we can learn how to use people as, as chisels or indicators or, or if, we, if we learn how to use people for introspection, we'll be much healthier. But our culture teaches us that someone else is always the, the source of my problems. You know, one of the things um, I love to read, um, there was a book I read when I was young. It's called Success Principles. It's by a dude named Jack Canfield. He, he um, I think he the one that started Chicken Noodle Soup for the Soul. But he wrote a book called Success Principles. And it was deep because he basically, they noted a pattern. They noticed a pattern of all successful people. And I think it's like 122 principles all these people live by. They made all, like all these successful people from different walks of life, different eras, this is what they live by. And this, and, and that's what made them successful. And guess what the first success principle was, if you want to be successful? And this is why most people will never be successful. The first principle of success is take responsibility for your own life. Everyone that succeeded, no matter what they went through, no matter what their upbringing was, no matter what trauma, abuse, neglect, at some point in their life, they said, I'm responsible. And when they said they were responsible and took responsibility, their life began to change. And a lot of us, we never take responsibility. Now, um, conflict resolution. So here's the thing, when we talk about conflict, when issues come up, you have to know how to uh, work on those things maturely you have to know how to work on those things um, godly. You have to know how to work on those things um, wisely. So you want to be mature, you want to be godly, and you want to be wise. Uh, one of the things that um, we tend to avoid in society is confrontation. Like we're unwilling to let people know what they've done. You know, and sometimes people, you could hurt someone and not even know it, and you'll find out months, years later, why they changed or what happened, and you didn't even know, right? So we're gonna be healthy in relationships. We can't be afraid of confrontation. If someone hurts you, one of the things that, um, that helps you, and this is something I, I would tell people, because I, I, I hoard wisdom. Because the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. 
like you need wisdom. So when I'm around people that's wise or I hear things, I just imbibe it. Now, one thing that I learned when I was younger, there's this system called the scale. And uh, we talk about the scale. There's a verse in the Bible that says that casting of lots ceases contention amongst the mighty. And, you know, when you see like with Jesus, when Jesus died, they cast lots over his his garment, over his his garment or whatever. We talk about casting lots. That would be the equivalent for us of like gambling or something like that. But to, to stop this fight, to stop this war, we're going to cast a lot. Now, for us, we, you know, I'm not telling you to throw dice over some of that. What I'm saying is this scale how important something is to you before you bring it up. So you scale it from one to 10. If it's a 10, you need to talk about it. If it's under a five, a five and below, it's not worth bringing up. Because you don't want to have unnecessary conversations and long, drawn-out conversations about stuff that does not mean nothing to you. You know, and I will say this softly. If everything is a 10 to you, you need to heal. Because everything shouldn't be important to you. All right? Okay, so um, you have to learn conflict resolution skills. You have, to, you have to realize that in a relationship, conflicts will arise. It says it's inevitable that offenses will come. Now, if someone offends you or if someone, um, someone offends you or if you have a disagreement with someone, you have to be mature, humble, and wise in the way you approach this. You, gotta, you don't want to approach this like this person is a major problem. Once again, when, when you have a conflict, you have to remember that we have an issue, but we're not the issue. We just have one, right? So I'm bringing up this issue so we can walk together wisely and effectively. I'm not bringing this issue up to tell you everything you did over the last five years. I'm not bringing this issue up to tell you what you're not. I'm not bringing this issue up to, to, to you know, one of the things we have to stop doing in relationships, we can't, um, we can't be accusatory, you know, because that's Satan's job. His job is to accuse the brethren all day and night. And there'll be times where I'm not going to lie. Sometimes people respond so harshly to you because you're an echo. So it's like if you're echoing what Satan is telling me, I'm already dealing with certain stuff in my psyche. And then now he comes to reinforce it through you. Don't be that demonic vessel that's used of Satan to accuse people of what they're not. And you don't use conflicts to take shots at people's character. But that's emotional intelligence, again, because you're empathizing. So when I'm empathizing, it's like, okay, if this was me, how would I want to be talked to and approached if I did something wrong? So I put myself in your shoes before we have the conversation, and I want to approach you from a place of empathy and not from reckless, uh, reckless uh, regard. And that's how, we, that's how we can be sometimes. When you're not emotionally intelligent, how you feel is so strong, you have no awareness or no regard for the psyche and the soul of that person. And then once you get done dumping and you get done, you know, going off, you know, you come back down, now you're regretting. But you can't take those words back. Like, I ain't gonna lie, me and Dana, I'm in these situations, all stuff like that. That's just, I, I can't do it. That's like a deal breaker. Like, if you, if we can't, do if we can't have a conversation without a accusation, I can't do it, especially when the accusation isn't true. And that's why I said you have to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger because you don't want to react without knowing what's really going on. Because once you do that, you create a perception of yourself that can be very hard to come back from sometimes. You now, the Bible says a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. So, once you offend somebody to a certain extent, it, it'll be easier to take over America than to get that person back, <laughs> right? All right, now this is gonna be very interesting. So Proverbs 22, I, I'm gonna go real fast. How much, how much longer, Lou? For real? All right, I'm done, I'm, hey, hey, this is it's a time miracle, ain't it? All right, Proverbs chapter uh, 22. You said 15? 18, I right, bet, we're gonna, I got three more parts, so six minutes, ah. let's check it out. All right, Proverbs chapter two, verse six. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. 
<laughs> it's a train of a child and ways to go, and he's old, he will not depart from it. So I want to present something to you that I wish I knew before I got married that will help you. But we're going to get into it. So there's this psychological construct called attachment theory. Anybody heard of attachment theory before? Yes. Okay. So attachment theory basically says that the way you were related to as a child affects how you show up in adult relationships. And I found out that attachment theory is very helpful because once you can understand what's happening in your soul, you can partner with the Holy Spirit to heal you. Because attachment theory gives you a framework and a language to understand what's happening in your soul. When you talk about attachment theory, you have four kinds. You have um, dismissive, I mean, you have secure, anxious, avoidant, and you have fearful. What's secure attachment? Secure attachment style is a person that was loved properly when they were young. You were loved properly. You got the, the emotional support you need. You got the attention that you need. So this person, a secure person, they, shows up, they show up healthy in a relationship. It's rare, you know, um, they say like 58% of people are secure. But a secure person will be the best person to be with in a relationship. You're secure. And you don't have to, you don't have, to have a perfect upbringing to be secure. You just have to allow the Spirit of God to work out your salvation so you could be secure in a relationship. So the goal for us is to become secure. One of the reasons I, I, I felt like this would be so helpful because once I got a divorce, I found out about attachment theory and I did the test. And I, I, I began to realize when I, when I thought about my wife, my ex-wife and how she showed up in a relationship, I realized that her attachment style was not good for me. And sometimes it's, and here's the thing, one thing about attachment style, it does not mean you will permanently be this way. Because he that begun a good work in you, he'll complete it. But can you acknowledge where you are? But our pride won't let us do that. We have to pretend like we got it all together. We have to pretend like we're perfectly whole, perfectly healthy, we have nothing going on. Because you can still be in a marriage and have an a, 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 a attachment style that's not secure. Even in your marriage, work on your soul. The Bible says God wants you to prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. God wants you to thrive in your perceptions, your emotions, your mind, your will. And if we don't allow the Spirit of God to work out these things in us, then we're going to show up. Um, we're going to show up wounded. We're going to show up um, stagnant in our relationships. So the first one is secure attachment style. But once again, these are things your parents your parents kind of train you up in the way, and it's kind of hard to get away from it when you're older. And um, we'll go to the second. The second one is called anxious attachment style. So basically, if you have an anxious attachment style, it means that your parent wasn't consistently meeting your needs. And because you weren't consistently meeting your needs, it's hard for you to be easily comforted. And how it works now is you're clingy, you're needing, or not trusting. So if you have an anxious attachment style, you're consumed with concern that you're going to be abandoned and you always need reassurance, right? Um, I think one of the things I learned, I used to always say I'm clingy, I'm clingy, I'm clingy. But one of the things that I, I struggled with when I was growing up was like abandonment, you know, and um, it, was like, it was like a generational curse. My mom was abandoned by her mom and her dad. And then at our dynamic, when we would get into it, I, I would deal with that abandonment stuff too. And it made it hard for me in relationships because basically when you're clingy, you're overcompensating, so you won't be abandoned. And that's something that you have to deal with and work out in yourself where you can be okay uh, within yourself. But um, it's interesting how the things that we go through when we're young, it still affects us in relationships, you know? Um, and I feel like uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> but if you have, and here's the thing, once again, when you, if you discover what attachment style you are or what's working in your soul, all you have to do as a believer is take it before the Holy Spirit, acknowledge it, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you um, be whole or make you whole. But here's the thing, one of the ways that God answers prayers is by processes. And a lot of times God answers the prayer and we don't like the process. But you know, God has a process he's going to take you through to answer the prayer. So when God starts your process, 
be okay with it and submit to it because God loves the process. I remember the Lord spoke to me when I was young. He said, you love the outcome. He said, I like the process because the process is when you get depth in God. The process is when your character changes. The process is when you get some roots. But without the process, you're going to be unstable. You're just going to be, uh, you're going to have a mind of, about God of consumerism. You just receive, 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 receive. But um, this is important to know. Um, so what happens when you have an anxious attachment style is you drive your partner away because you're needy. And then it also creates more feelings of insecurity in relationships because you're going to feel like you're never good enough. But this is something you have to take before God and let God love on you. Well, you're not afraid of being abandoned because what? He'll never leave you or forsake you. Am I right about it? So we have avoidant attachment style is next. So the avoidant attachment style, how this happens is your caregiver does not give you enough emotional support. And what happens is you end up caring for yourself, right? So you, you've learned not to rely on other people to care for you. But how does it look like now? <laughs> When you have this kind of style, when you have this type of style, avoidant, you're self-reliant and you're emotionally guarded. Anyone in here a person, nobody can get close to you. You don't need nobody. You're doing good all by yourself. That's that, that's that style, <laughs> you know? And when you're like that, you've learned, I, I can't rely on people. So I'm gonna rely on myself. But that's not good for a woman and a man because a man wants to feel necessary. You may not at the beginning, you don't want to, you know, overly do it, but make that man feel welcome. Make that man feel like he's necessary in some type of way. Like you can see him fulfilling the role. You can see him being a leader. Because when a man deals with a woman who makes him feel unnecessary, he's not going to stay. So when you talk about um, you avoid an attachment style, you're self-reliant and you're overly, you're emotionally guarded, and you're not going to seek emotional comfort, and you're not going to know how to comfort other people, because since you've learned how to deal with everything yourself, you're not going to show up, you're not going to be present, you're not going to be helpful, and it's going to be hard to get to know, because you're going to feel like it, it's no point in getting to know somebody, or no point in getting close to this person, because they're not going to stay around, or I can't depend on them, so I'm self-sufficient, right? But when you have this attachment style, what you do is you distance yourself from other people and you already have assumed that this person is going to disappoint me. So in other words, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you meet somebody and you meet them and you're not relying on them. You're not open to them. You're not because I ain't gonna lie. Genuine men, real men thrive with a vulnerable woman. And when you're not vulnerable, that man feels unnecessary. And you don't have to be it's overly vulnerable at the beginning but demonstrate some level of vulnerability because vulnerability is like a magnet to a real man. When you're vulnerable and you make yourself, you know, useful, or when I say useful, you make him useful, then he'll want to stick around. But when you have this avoiding attachment style, you push people away. Um, you really push people away. All right, the last one is fearful avoidant. This is the most extreme, but um, it's so interesting. So. When you have fearful avoidant, you act irrationally and you can be unpredictable and intense. So what happens is when you're fearful, you had a very hard childhood and your childhood was marked by fear and trauma. And because you had an erratic or incoherent relationship with your parent, when you're an adult, when you're an adult, what's going to happen is you're going to crave inside. You're going to really, really want a close relationship. But anytime somebody gets close to you, you're going to push them away. That's so interesting. But it's like, this was so dynamic for me because I feel like those who are marriage counselors, if you can help people understand their attachment style, you get them a blueprint on stuff they need to work on. I think people don't, people, like church people say, work on stuff, da, da, da. where do I start? I have no idea where to start. Work on yourself. I have no idea. I have no idea why I feel the way I feel. I have no idea why I show up the way I show up. I have no idea why I respond the way I respond. So I feel like if you're a marriage counselor or you deal with people, that's a, that's a good tool in your toolbox. Teach people about attachment theory and help them understand some of the stuff they need to work on to show up. How much more time, Lou? Uh, 21 minutes. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I, 
All right, Tim, we're gonna, I'm going to do this quick. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say something quick. Um, so it's unnecessary. Never mind. I'll skip it. All right, let's go to the next one. So one thing that will help you show up in a relationship is learn the needs of the opposite sex. Learn the needs of the opposite sex. Now, these are things you can learn while you're single. Once again, we're trying to prepare you to get married. Wanted to be a testimony that over the next year, you had a lot of stuff to work on. And then when you got to a relationship, you got a healthy relationship, or you're able to identify a relationship immediately that wouldn't work for you. So we talk about, you know, the needs of the says Now, I'm a reader. I advise you to read. Reading is good. Reading is helpful. I know. Oh, I ain't going to say that. Sometimes we were taught just pray and don't read. And, you know, that, that shows up sometimes. But um, there, there's a book. <laughs> <laughs> there, Lord, that there's a book called by um his name is Willard J Harley. It's called His Needs, Her Needs, and this book is powerful. If you're a marriage counselor, you're married. If you're married or single, I advise you to read that book. Um, Willard J Harley, or it may be F, but the name of the book is His Needs, Her Needs. And what happened was this guy was a counselor, and they interviewed ten thousand divorcees as to why they got a divorce. And what happened was the women kept saying five things and the men kept saying five things. And they began to realize that these were the needs of a woman and these were the needs of a man. Interest, interestingly enough, men have a tendency to feel as if their needs are the woman's needs and women have a tendency to feel as if their needs are the man's needs. So imagine you're giving a man what he want, and he's giving you what he wants, when it should be you giving a man what he needs, and the man is giving you what you need. So I'm going to go through this real quick, just what they need. So a woman, um, and this is, we talked about in the construct of marriage. You still need to know this, though. So a woman needs affection. Affection is not sex. A woman needs affection. She needs to know you care about her. She needs to know you love her. She needs to know that she's special to you. She needs to know that you cherish her. A woman needs intimate conversation, you know, not shallow conversation, not conversation about sports, politics, a conversation about what happened at work. She needs to, she needs to know your heart. She needs you to hear her heart. She needs you to know the innermost parts of her. A woman needs financial security. You need to be a man that can provide. And if you can't provide, you need to make it happen because she needs to know that she's gonna be taken care of financially. That's the need of a woman. A woman also needs family commitment. She needs you to be a good father and committed to um, being a good father, being present for your family. And once again, when these needs are not met, relationships and marriages break down. So when you don't know how to meet these needs, you're not a good candidate for a relationship or a marriage. The last one is a, a woman needs honesty and openness. She needs you to be open with her and honest with her. She needs to be able to trust you. If a woman cannot trust you, that's it. And that's what happens. You know, men break trust and it never recovers. So just be honest and open from the jump and at all times. Now, I realized that I just told the woman's needs to, uh, what, what's your name one more time? Wayne. Wayne. Wayne is the only single man here, right? Besides me, all right. So let's talk to the women. So what men need, men need physical attraction. Men need a woman that keeps herself up, a woman that is in shape, a woman that cares about her personal appearance. That's what men need. Um, and marriage, number two, men need sex. Women can't understand that, they don't understand why, but that's what a man needs. A man needs sex. So if you're gonna be married, expect to have a lot of sex with your husband because that's what he needs, right? All right, number three, a man needs peace and quiet. I love how Mikhail said it, your house cannot be a war zone. A man needs to come home and know his house is a sanctuary. He done, you've, been, you've been getting into it at work, God told your boss, God told your friend, and you come home, <laughs> hey, <laughs> you get into it with your wife, this day, he, he disappear. He's like, where Lou at? <laughs> Lou <Lou'd> the <have> dipped. <laughs> 
Hey, hey, you you need to go home and have peace and quiet. You 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 got enough war outside the house. Number four, a man needs admiration. This is where women fail, because one of the things I learned growing up was that, um, I, and I'll say it twofold. So, the woman that praises your man the most is the one he could be most vulnerable to. So the most praise from your man should come from you. And don't try to praise your man after y'all just got into it, because it's gonna feel unauthentic, inauthentic. So make sure you praise him. Let your man know what you love about him, what's good about him, etc. Now, the man that has the greatest potential to steal your woman or to your woman to be vulnerable towards is the one that understands her the most. So you need to understand your woman. You need to understand why she thinks the way she thinks, why she does the things she does, why she responds the way she responds, because she thrives with understanding. But back to the men, men need admiration. If, here's the thing. If you cannot respect how a man thinks, and if you cannot respect what a man does with his life, he's not for you. We believe in miracles, but know what you're getting into before you get married, all right? Number I right, temperament. Now, I heard someone say this, and it hit me so deep, because this is where a lot of church people fail, is before you marry someone, they say the most important element to consider in marriage is a temperament. What is a temperament? A temperament is someone's personality, that their predisposition. In other words, when you get married, it doesn't, because people just think he's a prophet, he's this, he's that, she's that. None of that stuff means nothing. What matters is their disposition. Are they always angry? You ever been around someone that's just irritable? I mean, wake up irritated, go to sleep irritated. You ever been around someone that's just vexed and uh, intense? I remember if they used to be like, Darnell is so intense. Thank God I'm not the way anymore. But can you imagine just always so focused on something that Lou coming like, Darnell cannot. And it's like you got to touch like you. If you touch this man, you, you just stop the greatest problem solver on the face of the earth because their mind is always occupied. You need to know someone's temperament because if you can't live with their temperament, it's not going to work. When you're engaging with someone for marriage, what you're looking at is, can I joyfully and peacefully and enjoyably live with this person for the rest of my life? And just because someone is a minister and knows the Bible does not mean they're going to be, like they say that, Sometimes ministers are the worst candidates for marriage because of their temperament and because of their inability to show up and be present. They're trying to solve the world's greatest problems, but neglecting their home, right? All right, their interests and goals. Do your interests and goals, are they compatible? You're not looking for you. You're not looking for a pastor. You're not looking for a minister. I'm telling you, man, at some point, you gotta stop idolizing ministry people. Because it's not, it's not what you think. And, you know, a lot of times you get with those people and it's a facade. It's a projection. I remember, like, one of the ways I failed in marriage, what, what God had to deliver me, I always was looking for a leader. Somebody, that, a woman that was doing something great. Great, I'm talking about everyone I was talking to, I write them down on paper. It's like, wow, she's impressive. Like, she got all this going, yada, yada, yada. But in terms of being present in a, you need to understand the things that are essential to relationships, what you should look for. Can they forgive? Are they nurturing? Are they compassionate? Are they uh, faithful? Um, are they caring? Um, are they all the intangibles is what you look at. Stop looking at that person's status and clout and whatever, or you're gonna be hurt. Last one is before you get married, you need to consider someone's weaknesses and flaws. You're not marrying a perfect person. You're marrying a work in progress. And you need to ask yourself, can I live with this person's weakness and flaws for the rest of my life? <laughs> because if you can't accept their flaws and their weaknesses, it's not gonna work. So I just wanna encourage you guys, and I hope I helped you, but before you say I do, amen. amen.